Good morning and welcome to Palestine Methodist Church. We're glad that you could join us this morning and hope you've had a really good week and we appreciate you being with us during this time of worship. Our announcements for those of you that are here are in the bulletin. Wednesday night, Facebook Bible study at 6.30 p.m. each Wednesday. Um, Coffee fellowship time at 8.15 to 8.30 on Sunday mornings. And that's when it begins, 8.15 to 8.30. Uh, Fat Tuesday is February 13th at 5 p.m. And I'll have a sign-up sheet next week that we can bring. I mean, a food that we can bring. Um, And then Ash Wednesday service is February 14th at 6 p.m. And somebody's got a birthday this week, Tuesday. That would be Curly. We're glad you're back. He got snowed and iced in, and and we sure are glad you're back. It's Tuesday. I'm wrong. When's his birthday? You've been messing with him this morning? Yeah, I've been passing with him. Okay. And we've already had the experience of snow or ice covering the road and church service being canceled, so I think you all know that real well. Are there any other announcements we'd like? Good morning, Linda. I didn't get back there to hug you this morning. This one over here. <laughs> Linda Fay, not Linda Carolyn. <laughs> you know, we, we could go ahead and sing happy birthday. I think that'd be good. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, dear Curly. Happy birthday to you. Many more. And Woodrow is in the house, and we're so glad that he's with us again today. He does really good. I just still think we need to take him into the membership. Let's bow and join in the opening prayer together. Gracious God, touch us with your spirit this morning and open our hearts. Set us free from the bondage of our sins and give us the hope of the abundant life which you have known to us through your son, Jesus Christ, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit. One God, now and forever. Amen. Call to worship is on page 859 of the hymnal. It's Psalm 147, verses 1 through 12, and then verse 21. There's just something special about Woodrow being here. Praise the Lord, for it is good to sing praises to our God. A song of praise is fitting. The Lord builds up Jerusalem and gathers the outcast of Israel. The Lord heals the brokenhearted and binds up their wounds. The Lord determines the number of the stars and gives to all of them their names. Great is our Lord and abundant in power, whose understanding is beyond measure. The Lord lifts up the downtrodden that cast the wicked to the ground. Sing to the Lord with thanksgiving. Make melody upon the lyre to our God, who covers the heavens with clouds, prepares rain for the earth, 
makes grass grow upon the hills. The Lord gives to the beasts their food and to the young ravens that cry. The Lord takes no delight in the might of a horse, nor pleasure in the strength of a runner. But the Lord takes pleasure in the faithful and those who hope in the Lord's steadfast love. Praise the Lord, O Jerusalem. Praise your God, O Zion. The Lord strengthens the bars of your gate. Blesses your children in the midst. Um, make, makes peace in your borders. Fills you with the finest wheat. The Lord sends forth commands to the earth. The word The Lord gives snow like wool, scatters hoarfrost like ashes, cast forth ice like morsels, who can withstand its cold? The Lord stands forth the sends forth the word and melts them, makes the wind blow and the waters flow. The Lord declares the word to Jacob, and the statues and ordinances to Israel. The Lord has not dealt thus with any other nation. They do not know God's ordinances. Praise, Praise the Lord. Lord. Amen. I believe Jim has some thoughts for us this morning. I think it was Tuesday morning, <clears throat> I was reading the devotional, one that I read from quite a bit, it's called Mornings with Jesus, it's published by Guidepost. And in, in, this, <clears throat> in this devotional, wow, it is unbalanced, isn't it? Just tell me. Just uh, in this devotional, there were two words that jumped out at me. And why, I, I don't know, but they, they hung around all week long. And I kept, what am I supposed to do with these two words? And even when I came in Friday, I said something to Deb, and I said, I've got these two words in my head, and I have no idea what I'm supposed to do with them. And well, when I came in from the Y Saturday, I was talking with Frank and Deb, and in that conversation, there was something said that it made it all come together. <laughs> so weird. I was making your red beans and rice, by the way. Oh, you your, were, yeah, right? I was making red beans and rice. And I had to get to a point where I could go start writing, and that's what I did. I immediately went to down and I started writing. The two words, the first one was message. You're thinking, what? <laughs> yeah, well, the first word was message. Now, Webster says that a message is a verbal or written or recorded communication that's sent to, given to, left for any recipient message. The other word was messenger. You think, well, everybody knows what a messenger is. <clears throat> but Webster says that a messenger is one who bears a message or takes a message or communication from one person to another or one place to another. In another publication, it had multiple definitions, but <clears throat> the one that fit what I'm going to talk about today, it says that um, the message is a conduit or a vessel through which a message can be sent. Now, we've all heard of vessels in, as far as scripturally. We are to be the vessel. I mean, that's, you know, the message is supposed to come to us, through us. Well, I decided to find out what does Webster say about a vessel. Well, the first thing it says is it's a hollow container. A vessel is a hollow container or a person or a thing through which a message can be sent. Now, I know that it had multiple definitions about ships and all that, but this is the one that fit for this topic today. And then I looked up the word conduit. We all know what a conduit is. It's what you run those wires through so the mice can't chew on them, et cetera, et cetera. And, but it says a conduit <clears throat> is something, an object, or a person through which something can be an object or a person through which something is delivered. Very similar to what a messenger is, right? Well, <clears throat> when we think of messengers, 
The first one I thought about was Gabriel. The archangel Gabriel. He was the most infamous messenger that I knew of anyway other than Jesus. Gabriel, of course, visited Mary, visited Joseph, visited Zechariah, and visited Daniel. So he was God's messenger. He took messages directly from God, and he delivered that exact message to that particular person. And then I thought while I was thinking about Gabriel as an angel, I said, well, where does, I'm going, where does that word come from? So I looked up the derivation of angel. And one of the definitions, it says it's derived from angelos, which is Los Angeles. Angelos means one who brings a message. I thought that's kind of fitting for what I'm going to try to talk about anyway. Timothy says, 2 Timothy in 2.15, he says, Do your best to present yourself to God as one approved, like a worker who has no need to be ashamed, as you justly, ha justly handle the word of truth. I think what, Dan Daniel, I mean, what Timothy's telling us here is that um, do your best to represent God. If we, are, if we say we're one that's being approved, then we need to do our best to be truthful and just with the word that we transmit. In order to be an effective vessel or conduit, it would be important, now remember the definitions, it's through which something goes. In order to be a, a good conduit or a, or a vessel, we would have to trans, transmit or emit the message, the word, correctly and justly. So if we have, if, if, if we can represent God in, with our love, with our mercy, with our forgiveness, with our kindness, with our acts, those are the kind of things I think Timothy is saying, you know, be just. I mean, be just all the time. We know that the Bible is unequivocally the Word of God. That's where we get our message. That's where it comes from. In order for us to be able to give the message, in order for us to be a vessel or a conduit, we have to understand what the truth is. And the truth is in the Bible. And we can't do what I used to do. I would get hold it real close, or hopefully it would have osmosis it would go in because I didn't ever flip the pages very much I can tell you but we have to get into it to find out what it says to us now I know I'm biblically incorrect 99.9% of the time and I know that I know about one one thousandth of what I'm supposed to know about what's in the scriptures but I am learning that it's full of, of, of lots of things lots of answers For over 6,000 years, the message has been the same. But what's changed? The messengers. The messengers. And without our understanding of the message, we can't be a messenger or a conduit, or can we? I, as I said, I was the poster boy for doing it the wrong way. I did that for 68 years. I was not unlike a conduit. See, a conduit holds the wires, but it has nothing to do with the wiring. Much like a vessel or a crock of wine. They use a particular kind of crock so it doesn't interfere with the flavor of the wine. It has nothing to do with the wine other than it's holding it. I was exactly that kind of messenger and exactly that kind of vessel and exactly that kind of conduit. It flowed through me and I but I had nothing to do with it. Nothing. I just, I just, it was a role. It was a play. That is the difference in the conduit and the, and the vessel from a true messenger. James tells us in 3, 9, and 9 through 11, says, with our tongue we praise the Lord, and with, our, and with it we curse human beings who are also made in the likeness of God. Out of the same mouth comes praise and cursing. My brothers and sisters, that should not be. Fresh water and salt water cannot come from the same spring. 
what James is saying here to us is that, look, you can't on Sunday say this and then on Monday say this and on Tuesday say this. We have to decide whether we're going to have fresh water or salt water. What I'm trying to say, and I'll close it with this, and I, I know I've butchered what I've been trying to tell you. In order to be a conduit and a vessel are appropriate. If we're delivering a message like Gabriel did, God gave us this message and we're going to take that message. But what makes an effective messenger is when the messenger becomes the message. When the messenger absorbs the message, and unlike the crock of wine, and unlike the conduit that have nothing to do with what they have in them, we have to become part of the message, and then we become a good messenger. Good morning. Good morning. Scripture reading today is from Mark chapter 1, verses 29 through 39. Now, as soon as they had come out of the synagogue, they entered the house of Simon and Andrew with James and John. But Simon's wife's mother lay sick with a fever, and they told him about her at once. So he came and took her by the hand and lifted her up, and immediately the fever left her. And she served them. At evening, when the sun had set, they brought to him all who were sick and those who were demon-possessed. And the whole city was gathered together at the door. Then he healed many who were sick with various diseases and cast out the many demons. And he did not allow the demons to speak because they knew him. Now in the morning, having risen from a long while before daylight, he went out and departed to a solitary place, and there he prayed. And Simon and those who were with him searched for him. When they found him, they said to him, Everyone is looking for you. But he said to them, Let us go into the next towns, that I may preach there also. For this purpose I have come forth. And he was preaching in their synagogues throughout all Galilee and casting out the demons. Word of God for the people of God. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Our hymn of Apostles' Creed found on page 881, followed by the Gloria Patri. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead, he ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, 
the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Ghost, as it was in the beginning, is now and ever shall be world without end amen amen <clears throat> the prayer concerns are on the back of the bulletin To remember Ricky Boyd family and Coach Gibbs family and um, Rusty and his family as they're going through some family issues right now. Um, are there any others that we'd like to add or update? Yes, ma'am. Colicky babies. Anyone else? Yeah, Josh has been in the hospital since ooh, Tuesday, no, Wednesday, Wednesday? I don't remember. Um, and he's, they're, they're having a hard time controlling pain and nausea and all that kind of good stuff. So if you would keep Josh in your prayers as well. Mm hmm Oh, really? Well, they need to kind of check on Miss Jeannie again, don't they? Yeah, and she thought it was one spot, but it's not. It's the cellulite. Yeah, cellul yeah cellulitis. Yeah, she thought it was something really bad. This should be getting better by now. Anyone else? Do we have any joys we'd like to share? I do. I do. Here. So Joy Carly's here. My granddaughter, Katie, took her registered nurse certification boards and she passed. Oh, good. Oh, Lord, I, I'm so thankful that, that uh, Jesus has walked with her during this journey. It has just been so hard you know her mom's a single mom and you know they they've uh, they've walked through the fire so to speak and, and and come out and i'm just so grateful to god that uh that he's been with her in this journey and i pray that her efforts are fruitful but we're very very happy for her that's great that is really great Yeah. Yeah. It's always good to get these kind of breaks during February, especially after we have been in ice and all that sub freezing temperature for a week or more. She was home for a week. Now, you know, that's bad when Nissan's going to close down for a week. Yeah. But. Spring is not here yet, even though it might feel like it. I'm sure we'll have a couple of more bouts of this winter stuff. 
Any other joys? Yes, sir? Oh, good. Good. She's get, that's, a, that's another joy. Okay. Yeah. But anyway, his name was Wilfred Boyd. Wilfred Boyd. And he was one of the nicest men I ever knew. Well, anyone else? Let's bow. <clears throat> Father, we thank you for this day that you have given us. We thank you for the many ways each and every day that you come to us, that you inspire us, the days that, like Jim, you put words in our minds and and maybe it takes a few days to realize what you meant by those words. We thank you for your ever-caring We thank you for always being with us. And Father, there's so many times when we absolutely turn our back on you. There's so many times that that we, like the Israelites, go into hiding. There's times that we don't want to see your face and we don't want to hear your words. There's times when we become self-absorbed. And gracious God, we know that's not the place you want us to be. I ask that you help us to continue facing you. Help us to not be like the Israelites. Your grace and your mercy are things that we we really can't live without. Continue to be with us, to form us and make us into the people that you would like for us to be. And Father, for those who are in grief this morning, I ask that you comfort them and bring them peace. For others who may be going through different tests or perhaps are in hospitals or nursing homes or recovering from health issues, I ask that you be with them, their medical staff, their families, Father, there's people out there today that they may be having financial problems and we ask for your leadership and guidance for them. And for others that that may be having relationship problems or family problems, we ask that your arms surround them, lead them and guide them and help open their eyes for the things that they truly need. I ask all this in Christ's name, who taught his disciples to pray most perfectly. By saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power and the glory forever. Amen. <clears throat> Scripture this morning is from Isaiah chapter 40, verses, 30, verses 21 through 31. Isaiah, chapter 40, 
chapter 40, verse 21 through 31. Have you not known? Have you not heard? Has it not been told to you from the beginning? Have you not understood from the foundations of the earth? It is he who sits above the circle of the earth, and its inhabitants are like grasshoppers, who stretches out the heavens like a curtain and spreads them like a tent to live in who brings princes to naught and makes the rulers of the earth as nothing. Scarcely are they planted, scarcely sown. Scarcely has their stem taken root in the earth. When he blows upon them and they wither, and the tempest carries them off like stubble. To whom then will you compare me? Or who is my equal, says the Holy One? Lift up your eyes on high and see who created these. He who brings out of their host and numbers them, calling them by name because he is great in strength, mighty in power, not one is missing. Why do you say, O Jacob, and speak, O Israel? My way is hidden from the Lord, and my right is is disregarded by my God. Have you not known? Have you not heard? The Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth. He does not faint or grow weary. His understanding is unsearchable. He gives power to the faint and strengthens the powerless. Even youths will faint and be weary, and the young will fall exhausted. But those who wait for the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. May God add his blessing to the reading and hearing of his words. During the time that Isaiah wrote these words to the people of Israel, they were in exile. And it seemed that that was one of their favorite places to go throughout the Old Testament was in exile. This was a Babylonian exile not the Egyptian exile. And God called several of his prophets to go and comfort his people Israel. They had lost hope. They had been, a lot of them had been in eczema, in, in eczema had been in exile the majority of their life. Things weren't really going well for them. They saw no light at the end of the tunnel, except that their exile was about to end. But that really was no hope for them. And that made what perhaps a little bit of hope that they did have fade pretty quick because they didn't know what they were going to do. They... They didn't know where they would go. They didn't know what awaited them. They didn't know what would be next. Fear set in. And since most of them had lived in exile all of their life, they had become very comfortable with that. And they didn't know what to do, and that's what brought the fear on them. Because they did not know the unknown. And they couldn't turn that into a reality for themselves. They were stuck. Afraid to, afraid to walk out on a new road. Because they would have to leave their uncomfortable. They, they would have to leave the comfort to be uncomfortable. You know, there's a whole lot of times when God does that. I don't know about y'all, but I can honestly tell you the truth right now, that he literally does afflict the comfortable and comfort the afflicted. I 
And I'll just leave it at that. If he does that to y'all, y'all already know it. If he hadn't, well, just wait. He will. <laughs> the Israels didn't have much hope. And after thinking where they were, where they had always been, they couldn't leave their home, a lot of them, because their home was in exile. Their strength and their power were stripped. It would be kind of like opening up a bird cage to a bird that had always been in that cage. The bird would be terrified to come out. I think if most of us were in that situation, we'd be saying the same things that some of them were saying, that their way was hidden from God. That they had been disregarded by God. In other words, they would be saying, you know, God really doesn't care about me. Look at the situation I'm in. He doesn't hear me. He's not looking down on me. He's not lifting me up. He doesn't understand what I'm going through right now. And all the while, they're sinking right back into themselves, even more than they were before. Because what they're really trying to do, and what God's trying to do, is pull them out of themselves to be like a, the opening of a brand new spring flower. But they didn't want it. They didn't want it. They didn't want to change. They wanted to stay just like they were because that was just good and fine with them. Why do I need to get out and walk a new road? Why do I need to go to a new place? I'm comfortable back here in exile. I'm grateful to be a prisoner of my own doing. Isaiah is writing to these people to convince them that they should return to their homeland. They should return to their homeland. There again, if you've lived most of your life in exile, you've already settled down there. You put up stakes, you got your house in order. You ain't going nowhere. And if you're convinced that that'd be a that'd be a better better place for you to stay than going to your homeland. There's got to be some fear in that too. If you tried to return, who would keep who would keep you safe on the road? Who would who would who would be there with you? People in exile had lost their identity. What they had done was they had gone to idol worship and they had turned their backs so far against God that they couldn't even see him if they wanted to. But yet at the same time, they blamed him for the position that they were in. Sharon, Sharon had a coffee cup this morning that said, do we give God headaches? I just happen to think, you know, that, that was the coolest coffee cup. Do we give God headaches? Well, you know good and well we do. We do. Did our kids give us headaches? Well, look at it like that.
Huh? He can, he can ha- yeah, he's a lot bigger. He can handle bigger headaches, right? Mm. But those people doubted. They didn't believe God was with them. They put more hope and trust in the temporary things than they did in eternal things. I wonder what would happen to the world if people put more hope into eternal things. I wonder what priority list would be in this world. instead of what we see now. Those are just my wonderments. People of Israel thought that God had forgotten them, turned away from them, when in fact they were the ones that turned away from God. I know I've told you all this story before, but I love it because it just brings back some really fun memories for me. When, uh, When mom and daddy... At one point, bought, they bought 10 acres out in the country. It was Daddy's dream. It was his dream, you know. And a four-bedroom house, it was great. All the grandkids could come and stay at one time. It was just really cool. Huh? Pool. Oh, and a pool. Yes, a pool. Had this great big old rustic barn, and Daddy had him some cows out there, and he was in hog heaven. Well, he had become interested in... And birds as well. So he'd built an aerator, I think is what you call it, because he had some button-tail quail. And one of those was so cute, I loved him to pieces because he was a little backwards from the rest of them. All the rest of quail, quail would just run around. And when he got real excited, his head would go down, his butt would go up, and he'd go backwards. <laughs> and, I mean, it was just the cutest thing. And why I loved that one so much, I don't know, but it was just... It was just so cute. But it was about that same time that my grandfather, who had the beginnings of dementia, moved in with them. And Daddy had, had fixed this really nice chicken cage area. I mean, it was really nice. You could walk in there. It was just really cool. He had pheasants. He had all these different kind of chickens, the kind that have, like, the feathers on, the, on their feet. I mean, it was just really cool. And... Mom and Daddy were still going to work at that point. And it, I think it took Mama a, few day, Mama a few days to figure out that my grandfather, after they would leave to go to work, would go and let the chickens out of their, out of their pen. So when Mama would come home in the afternoon, there would be chicken droppings all over the yard. Well... I used to love to watch those chickens when, because, you know, whenever they would come out and whenever my grandfather would let them out, I'd, I'd be down there at some point and see them. And he would open up the door to those chicken cages and those chickens would kind of slowly come out. And then they'd just start pecking and pecking and scratching and pecking. And that's all they ever did. They never flew. They never ran. They never took off for Florida to have any fun. All they did was peck and scratch, peck and scratch, peck and scratch. It didn't matter that one of them looked like Pharaoh. I mean, he was gorgeous. And the other ones with the, that were white and had the, the, the feathers, I mean, they were, they were beautiful. But that didn't matter because that's all they ever did was peck and scratch. Peck and scratch. Now, supposedly about a year or so ago, there was an eagle that was sort of kind of in our neighborhood. And the it was somewhere in Pleasant View. But the, the story was that it was over kind of in, in our area. So we'd go out and we'd look up. I would. I don't know if you did. I'd go out and look up to see if I could find... That eagle, well, I don't know if I ever did. It was probably a hawk I was looking at. But I love to watch on TV how eagles soar. You know, they just, you hardly see them flapping their wings. They, 
they catch this little breeze and then they just soar. And they're massive and they're gorgeous. The nest of an eagle could be five or six feet round. They're powerful. Their wings are like eight feet wide, you know, the full span of them. They can travel 35 to 45 miles an hour. They don't have to eat often. They don't, they don't scratch, they don't peck. Their eyes are 10 times better than human eyes. They are focused. They know where they're going. They know what their purpose is. They don't wander around like chickens going nowhere, pecking and scratching, pecking and scratching. They are free to soar new heights and, <clears throat> and new adventures in areas that maybe they've never been before. They are a symbol of power and strength. And there's no wonder that Isaiah uses an eagle in the scripture. There are times when we, like the Israelites, feel we have no hope. We feel God has abandoned us. That he doesn't care about the mess we're in. that he can't hear our prayers, and maybe he doesn't want to if he could. Maybe we feel sometimes like we're just pecking and scratching our way through life. But God sends a message of hope, strength and power, and a reminder of his love for us. He says, come to me, you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Bring your burdens, bring your doubts. Bring everything that you have within you. He's big, he can handle it. He's bigger than any problem or any burden that we have. Do you not know? Have you not heard? The Lord is the everlasting God. He will not grow tired or weary, and his understanding no one can fathom. He gives strength to the weary and increases the power of the weak. Those who hope in the Lord will renew their strength. They will soar on wings like eagles. They will run and not grow weary. They will walk and not be faint. They will depend on God's strength and not our own. Isaiah brought words of hope and joy where there was sorrow, defeat, and disaster. His words told of the God that would either that, that would shelter his people and care for them. God's saving love to all humanity. He reminded them of the God who would lift them up on eagles' wings so that they could soar once again. Soar on the wings of eagles or scratch and peck like the chickens. 
As always, the choice is up to us. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Carly James, since you have not been here in a month, would you assist in serving communion this morning? Thank you. I'll let you know when. <laughs> if you would turn to page 12. <clears throat> Christ our Lord invites to his table all who love him who earnestly repent of their sin and seek to live in peace with one another. Therefore, let us confess our sin before God and one another. Merciful God, we confess that we have not loved you with our whole heart. We have failed to be an obedient church. We have not done your will. We have broken your law. We have rebelled against your love. We have not loved our neighbors. We have not heard the cry of the needy. Forgive us, we pray. Free us for joyful obedience. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Hear the good news. Christ died for us while we were yet sinners. And that proves God's love toward us. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. In the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. Glory to God. Amen. On page 13, under the great thanksgiving. One of the musical settings... I'm, I'm sorry. My mind is just not good this morning. Um, not that it ever is. The Lord be with you and also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. It is right and a good and joyful thing, always and everywhere, to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. And so with your people on earth and all the company of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. Holy, holy, holy Lord. God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Holy are you and blessed is your son, Jesus Christ. By the baptism of his suffering, death and resurrection, you gave birth to your church, delivered us from slavery to sin and death, and made with us a new covenant by water and the Spirit. On the night in which he gave himself up for us, he took bread and gave thanks to you, broke the bread, gave it to his disciples, and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. When the supper was over, he took the cup, gave thanks to you, gave it to his disciples, and said, Drink from this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant poured out for you and for many, for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it, in remembrance of me. And so in remembrance of these your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice, in union with Christ offering for us, as we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Pour out your Holy Spirit on us gathered here, and on these gifts of bread and wine. Make them be for us the body and blood of Christ, that we may be for the world the body of Christ redeemed by his blood. By your Spirit, make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world, until Christ comes in final victory, and we feast at his heavenly banquet. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit in your holy church, all honor and glory is yours, 
Almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. And go forth in peace, the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, and the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. <laughs>